Good evening and welcome to the 8th Inside Government Show for the Fall 2020 semester here at Cayuga Community College and broadcast on Spectrum, Verizon Fios, the Auburn Regional Media Access, better known as ARMA, as well as 80, uh, WIN 89.1, the college's radio station. I'm your host, Guy Cosentino. We had hoped tonight to bring you the candidates for the 24th Congressional District. They're asking for your votes when they go to the polls uh, on November 3rd or before, since early voting starts this weekend. Uh, to elect one, uh, someone to represent them in Congress. Uh, we're a district that includes not only Kiwi County, but three parts of three other counties. We contacted both campaigns of incumbent Congressman John Kako and his Democratic challenger, Dana Balter, as well as Working Families Party candidate Steve Williams to be part of a series of forums we have planned for this fall. So far, we've held one, and we have three more after tonight. While Ms. Balter immediately agreed to the date set for the forum, Congressman Katko was given several dates to uh, participate and declined all of those invitations, uh, as he did two years ago against Ms. Balter. After giving him uh, those dates to choose, we also contacted Mr. Williams, uh, who has since endorsed Ms. Balter. Uh, he is on the Working Families line, but he did not respond to the invitation. Something tells me it's because he was going to endorse Ms. Balter. As for our standard practice, uh, we've used more than a dozen years. If one candidate agrees to participate in a forum and the others either do not respond or don't agree, we do give that time to the candidates that do respond. Uh, that was the case when we first put this policy into place with David Valesky in 2006. And again, oddly enough, in 2014 when Mr. Kako was running for Congress and his opponent was Dan Maffei, who would not appear at that time, as well as other candidates for the legislature. Today we have in the studio, though, Dana Balter, who is running for the 24th congressional seat again. Uh, she narrowly lost in 2018. Uh, she won her second uh, Democratic primary, this being the second one in two years, handily earlier this summer. The Cook Political Report has changed the analysis of this race from lean Republican to toss-up, as has the national publication Politico. A new Siena poll, uh, and Syracuse.com poll, has Ms. Balter ahead of Congressman Katko by three points. That is, by the way, within the margin of error. Uh, Ms. Balter has also outraised uh, Mr. Katko in her, their most recent federal filing for the third quarter of 2020 by about almost, uh, by roughly $400,000. We're going to talk to her about all of those items and more uh, over the next hour as we welcome her back to Inside Government. It's great to have you here. Thank you so much. It's great to be with you. I think this is your third or fourth or maybe fifth appearance because you've been so here in different like capacities. Home. That's great. We'd love to have you here. Um, so, uh, before getting into all the minutia of campaigns and elections, how are you doing during COVID-19? Well, mostly very well. I consider myself to be extremely lucky um, because I'm talking to lots of folks who are really struggling. Um, and I am doing okay. It's definitely hard. Um, I miss regular human contact. You know, here we are doing something normal, but we're sitting so right. far away from each other and we're taking precautions and there's masks and sanitizer everywhere, you which is great. You brought your right. mask, you had to be checked in. That's why you have a red band yes. on your, your And hand. it's wonderful to see um, Cuga Community College and all of the other organizations and institutions around our community um, doing what's necessary to keep us safe. But it's, it's personally difficult and and I think like many people I miss the um, much more direct and close interpersonal contact that in a normal campaign year or in uh, normal I'd be life. having or in normal life. <laughs> so yes. if you had gone back eleven months, twelve months, you would never have envisioned running a campaign this way. Certainly. So not. how's it changed in, in the difference from everything from events to fundraising mm -hmm. to rallies which don't exist. How does right. that change? Well, uh, mostly the campaign, I am campaigning from my living room and I have a, a full campaign team and we're all working remotely. So everybody is in their home, you know, with a computer and a phone doing everything so that we, we can So we do know remotely. that somebody's going to have a book come out next summer about the Zoom camp. Yeah, right. That's I'm the sure. somewhere in the title. I'm sure. And we're making use of those tools. And, and I'm, I can't tell you how grateful I am that we have the technological tools to stay connected. Um, and there have been some unexpected benefits too, right? So we can't go door to door. We can't do big public events like we normally would. We've moved everything online. And one of the surprises that's been really nice is 
it's been able to connect us with a whole segment of the community who previously weren't engaged, right? Think about somebody who um, isn't gonna come out to a town hall on a Tuesday evening at the local library, either because they're not sure they're interested in politics or because they have kids at home and they don't have childcare or they don't have transportation to get there. When we bring the event to your living room using Zoom or Facebook Live or one of the other technologies, it's much easier for people to access. So new people have been able to participate, which is wonderful. The downside of that, of course, is that we still have a real digital divide. So I was going to ask that question. So you have, you are largely, uh, while well, you have some municipalities, mm -hmm. cities like Auburn and Syracuse, you have a lot of rural areas where mm -hmm. there is a digital divide. Mm -hmm. we're, we're unfortunately ending the census today, which is a whole different issue. Yes, uh, yes. Yeah, and we talked about that on Tuesday, but uh, with that, we have areas up in, in the far part of the county in the south where there is no broadband, no internet. And then there's the other issue in the city of Auburn where some people don't have the uh, access to equipment. Right. So how is that, and, and I guess, and I'm not saying all seniors because I have a dad who is very internet savvy, most likely mm -hmm. more than I am, <laughs> uh, which nobody in this studio is surprised about. <laughs> he can do this, but how about other seniors who may not, their only link is either you visiting them, you sending them a mail, or they're seeing you on TV, on TV right. and by the way, there's a limit on that, and we'll get to that in a little bit mm -hmm. later. So how do you deal with that? So it is a real problem, and I'll, I'll, you mentioned the difference between cities and rural areas, and I just want to point out that this is the digital divide is a problem in both rural communities and urban communities, and I think this is one of the things that the COVID crisis has really highlighted for us very clearly, because when we went to remote learning for schools, it suddenly became very apparent how many kids in our communities did not have access to broadband. And that can be because there are no broadband connections to the community, and it can be because they don't have the equipment. In the city of Syracuse, for example, 40% of households don't have reliable broadband access. So this is uh, uh, the only part of our district that doesn't have this challenge is the suburbs. Everywhere else, this is a real challenge we have to so deal with. So do you with. see that as a, uh, you know, we talk a lot about infrastructure, and I don't want to get into mm -hmm. the nitty-gritty of it right now, but once we get through all this, mm -hmm. is that where, we talk about roads and bridges, we talk about sewers, yep. uh, almost all the unglamorous things, but is broadband going to be the na the next? Uh, Felix Rotten wrote a book uh, five, almost like 10 years ago about our big, big ideas, and he mm -hmm. talked about the Erie Canal, Eisenhower's interstate, is broadband the next phase for us? It absolutely is a critical part of the next phase of infrastructure development across this country. And um, if you want to talk about this topic, I'd, I'd love to because there's a lot that we have to address. Uh, the House actually passed an infrastructure bill earlier this year, a $1.5 trillion package. Congressman Katko voted against it, of course. But included in that bill was $80 billion specifically for broadband to address this fundamental problem and making sure we need it for all kinds of reasons. But especially as the COVID crisis continues, we need it because kids who have to learn remotely, people who have to conduct business remotely, families that need to communicate remotely, it is, it's an essential part of getting through the COVID crisis. Um, and yes, I think it's going to be a major project going forward. So let's talk about COVID for a second. Sure. Well, it's going to be more than a second. It's going to be a couple of minutes. Um, how do you think Washington has responded to the COVID-19 pandemic? Well, I think we have to differentiate different parts of Washington. Um, I think that the president and his administration have done a horrendous job of responding to this pandemic. Uh, we know from interviews, we know from press reports, we know from the president's own statements that he knew very well how dangerous this was, he knew how contagious it was, and he knew what needed to be done to contain the spread of this virus, and he refused to do it. In fact, here we are eight months into the crisis, and he still refuses to do what needs to be done, which is very clear. We need a national testing program, a national tracing program, we need people wearing masks, and we need to invest in uh, vaccines and treatments and put them through the rigorous FDA processes to make sure that they're safe and effective. 
Donald Trump and his administration have consistently refused to get a hold, get control of this virus with testing and tracing and masks. Um, I hope he has a change of heart and will start doing those things. My guess is that until Joe Biden is president, we're not going to make progress in containing this virus. So let's take parts of this before we go to the rest of Washington first. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned a couple things. So let's talk about vaccines and masks first. Mm -hmm. uh, should, you know, I, I didn't know this until we started doing these shows back in, in March. We don't have a national policy on flu vaccines, let alone for mm -hmm. schools uh, and especially for children. Should there be a policy, just as we require other vaccines when you go into elementary school, that people get a flu shot? Forget COVID-19 right now, mm -hmm. just a flu shot. Well, I think, um, I don't know if that is necessary. Uh, because we make very good use of the flu vaccines that we have. So what about COVID-19? What happens if we get, forget whether it's good or bad right now, because we'll get to that mm -hmm. in a second. Should there be a mandate for a, that people do need to get a COVID-19 shot? Well, I think we have to s wait and see what the vaccine is. So one reason with flu vaccines, there are certain categories of people because of their existing medical conditions, uh, it's actually not recommended by doctors and experts that they get the vaccine for the flu, which is one of the reasons why it's so important that the rest of us do, because we have to help but you protect have to worry people about who can't. Doctor shopping in that particular case, don't you? Well, no, you shouldn't have to, because the the recommendations shouldn't be based on what an individual doctor in a community thinks. The recommendations. This is why it's so important that we have. Um, entities like the CDC. The recommendations should come from the government experts. So there should be rules. Yes. And people will Guidelines. have to check yes. boxes. Yes. What I'm saying is that's not what you have to do now when it comes to the flu vaccine. I, well, I think that there should be. Okay. And I think we need to see what um, this is why the testing procedures for a vaccine are so important because part of what we learn during that process is are there groups of people for whom this vaccine is not appropriate? Who should be taking it? And part of the government's responsibility is to ensure that those protocols are followed, that they get the proper information, and that they issue guidance for the country to follow. So on the COVID-19 vaccine, and, and obviously there's been some companies over the last seven days who have either halted trials or mm -hmm. they've made some adjustments. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is a more global question, but I, I don't really want to go Washington is, is Washington. Do you think Washington, though, is taking shortcuts? And are you, but are you, is that balanced by pharmaceutical companies and the medical community basically saying we're not going to roll something out until we get it right? They look at the mental health, they look at all these other failures over swine flu and other problems, health problems that have been created over the last half century. Well, I, I will say I have been very encouraged to see uh, the pharmaceutical companies coming forward and saying we are not going to rush our trials, we're going to follow the proper procedures, we're not going to bring something to market that isn't ready. That's important and that is the responsible position to take and I'm grateful to hear them and see them uh, communicating that to the public. It's very disturbing that our president is on the opposite side of that argument and that he is in fact pushing the pharmaceutical companies to move faster than is safe, that he's talking about taking shortcuts with the FDA. Um, that puts us in danger. There are reasons why the procedures exist. There are reasons why we have these protocols because we need to make sure that any vaccine and any treatment that we develop is both safe and effective. Do you Assuming that Dr. Fauci, let me use mm -hmm. him as the, I'm, my instinct is he's the positive guy you would talk about yeah. in this. If Dr. Fauci and the CDC were to vouch for a vaccine, would you take it? If the experts say, and Dr. Fauci, I think, is at the top of our national expert list. Hoping he's time man of the year, but that's a different yeah. issue. If, uh, if the experts, the doctors and the scientists say this vaccine is safe, it is effective and it is ready, you bet. You will. So the other question, you, you mentioned masks. Uh, mm -hmm. And I know there's a whole national debate about what, what power the president has mm -hmm. on a mask policy. But would you support a mask requirement on federal property? Mm -hmm. 
just mandated that it would be. Do you think there should be a national ma uh, mask policy? I, my hope is that we don't need that. My hope is that with real leadership, um, the American people will um, do what is best for themselves and for each other, and people will wear masks. Um, I think it's unfortunate the president and uh, the people who surround and enable him have done a lot of damage to the credibility of uh, not only their own word, but the word of the actual experts. Um, so it may become necessary. Let's go back to you. You talked about the White House's response. Uh, mm -hmm. What would you have done differently? You mentioned some things such as uh, tracing and national policy. What else would you have done or like to have seen Washington or the White House done differently uh, in the pandemic so far? Well, uh, from the perspective of what the administration should have done, um, every single, or Congress, every yeah. single step should have been different. Um, it, we needed the president and the administration they to take do anything this right? seriously from the beginning. I'm, I have yet to see any correct actions taken. They um, hid information from the public, which they should not have done. They downplayed the seriousness of this, which they should not have done. They outright lied about uh, what they knew about it, which they should not have done. You're referring to the Bob Woodward tapes? Some yes. Of the, okay. Yes. Um, they've discouraged people from wearing masks. This, this simple mask is the single best preventive measure we have to fight this virus. And Donald Trump is still discouraging people from wearing them. So a viewer question, do you think the president did contract COVID? I, they say he did, so I have no reason to are think he didn't. Are you surprised he's on the campaign trail? I am not surprised, but I'm disappointed. So you think he should not be? Right. So I um, also think he should not have gone back to the White House when he did. He put everybody who works in the White House in danger. So uh, let's talk about money and, and sure. aid. So there's a lot of discussion right now, and, and Steve Mnuchin, the Treasury Secretary, mm -hmm. and Nancy Pelosi may or may not ha hammer something out. It does not look like there will be COVID aid to states before Election Day. Would you agree with that? It doesn't look like it, yeah. So if there is a COVID uh, relief, from your perspective, does it only get to an idea of, of delivering it after Election Day, after the Electoral College votes, hmm. after January 20th? Are we looking that far, or is it I off the not. table? I, I really hope not, because people are suffering. I mean, it should have happened months ago. And, and so this is the, the part of the previous question we didn't get to yet. Um, the, House of Representatives, under Nancy Pelosi's leadership, passed a big aid package in May, in May. And that package included a lot of things that we desperately need here. It included direct aid to state and local governments who are slashing budgets left and right because revenues are down from the pandemic. Um, that bill that the Democrats in the House passed, that John Katko voted against, would have brought just to our congressional district, just this three and a half county region, one billion dollars in direct aid to our city, town, and county governments. Because we don't have that, that included um, about 54 billion, fi about 54 million for the city of Auburn. It included 360 million for the city of Syracuse. Because we don't have that aid our city, town, county, and even state governments are cutting services, they're laying off employees, they're furloughing employees, and at the state level, we are talking about 20% cuts in services. That's 20% in hospitals, in schools, in police and fire. These are devastating cuts to critical services. So in priorities, if, if you were to vote on a, a, an aid bill, and if you get elected, you may, because it I may have to wait will. till January 21st. Even if this one passes, it's not going to be the last one. Okay. So when it comes to priorities, you mentioned municipalities. List them for me. Where do municipalities and schools and not-for-profits and PPE 
where are they in your priority list? I know they're all important, but you have to so make choices. Here's the thing. They are all important, and all of them need to be in the package. It is not acceptable to pass an aid package that doesn't meet our needs. And what we need is aid for our governments so that they can continue providing critical services. We need aid for individuals and households so that people can get through this economic crisis. And that means extending unemployment. It means hazard pay for frontline workers. It means moratoriums on evictions because so many people are facing homelessness because they can't pay their rent on the first of the month or make the next mortgage payment. It means food support because people are going hungry. It means protective equipment in our schools because we're sending our kids back to school and our educators and our students need to be safe and we have not made our schools safe enough. None of these things can be taken off the list. You can't trade so those away. So how do you pay for them all though? This is the big, the, the favorite question, right? Here's the thing. We are in a crisis right now. Now is not the time to be talking about what does the debt look like. Now is not the time to be so talking as far as about austerity. So the national debt issue, well, is it important or is it? Is it is important. But it's, does it, over, it does not override, in your view, a response to COVID. Absolutely not, because history shows us that the way you get through an economic crisis like this is with government support and investment in people and in the community. That's how you get the economy back on its feet. When the economy is back on its feet and money is flowing and taxes are coming in and revenues are coming into the government, then you go back to the conversation about, okay, how do we get debt under control? In the middle of an economic crisis is not the time to do that. And every period in our history shows us that. Uh, so you mentioned uh, taxes. I do want to ask you, we'll come back to COVID because it's going to circle throughout here. Sure. Uh, there are these tax cuts that have become uh, that have been a question for several years right now. Better known as the, uh, the the Trump tax cuts. Mm -hmm. um, I'm assume I just don't want to assume. Would you reverse uh, those tax cuts? I think Congressman Katko supported them. Would you reverse them as a whole or just parts of? that bill from several years ago. So Congressman Kako does support them still. He voted for them. Um, I think we should get rid of them. All and of them or just some of there's them? There's a couple different ways we could go about it. We could repeal the entire law and replace it with something entirely new, or we could take back parts of it. What's your preference? Um, I'm, I'm open to either. That's where I think negotiation comes in. That's where I think working with other people who have different ideas than I do to come to a solution comes in. But here's what we've got to accomplish. We have got to get rid of the tax cuts for millionaires, billionaires, and giant corporations that were the focus of that bill. What Congressman Kako does not like to acknowledge about it, which is borne out by facts, is that uh, the vast majority of the benefits, we're talking about 83% of the benefits of that bill, are for millionaires, billionaires, and wealthy corporations. That's not the kind of policy we should be passing. We need to put hardworking families, seniors, students, veterans, people with disabilities, they should be at the forefront of our tax policy. So you would not re rescind, I know there's ads going, and I hate to use ads as a reference point, but we mm -hmm. will. Um, there's this thought process nationally that by getting rid of the, the Trump tax cuts, every household will go up $3,000. Yeah, it's ridiculous. First of all, that assumes that every household went down $3,000, which it didn't. That was part of the lie that they sold us. Um, but I'm actually talking about cutting taxes for working families and raising taxes on the wealthy and corporations. Um, I support tax cuts for working families like expanding the child tax credit offering tax credits for child care and for other caregiving for aging relatives, for example. I support uh, extending a new tax credit for first-time home buyers. There are lots of ways that we can cut taxes for working families that are responsible, that help working families get a leg up, but at the same time, make sure that the wealthy and corporations pay their fair share. And the 2017 tax bill that John Katko supported did exactly the opposite of that. It's exactly the opposite priorities. And just, uh, we should say, and we'll say this throughout, and I, I don't have an internal clock with me right now, but uh, we did offer the chance for Congressman Katko and Mr. Williams, who was on the Working Families, 
to be here for these forums. Um, he, again, he declined two years ago. He's declining this year. Mm -hmm. uh, by the way, are you surprised about that? I'm not. It's, it's his pattern. As you said, he did it two years ago. We were invited to participate in six debates by major media outlets across the district How this year. How many will you do? Um, he only agreed to three, so there will be three debates. Um, uh, one of the things I was most disappointed about is the debates that he agreed to um, are all within a couple of weeks of election day. And because we have vote by mail, people have been voting in this election for three weeks already. And there will and be they remote voting that will start this Saturday. Right. And those voters haven't had the opportunity to see us side by side. It's a shame. So let's get into some other issues that uh, are here. Um, if President Trump is reelected, what do you see as your role as a member of Congress? <sighs> well, um, I did hear the sigh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what you didn't hear was my stomach drop. Um, I think if President Trump were to be elected, it would be an absolute disaster for this country. Um, I am doing everything I can to make sure but that Joe Biden see, wins. What would you see as a, as a, because there is little doubt from current polling mm -hmm. that the House of Representatives will stay in the Democratic Party's mm -hmm. hands. So you would be, if you were elected, a majority member. Yes. What would your role as a majority member with a Republican White House be? Mm -hmm. So I think um, there are a couple of really important roles for Congress. One, as a member of Congress, my main focus will be on bringing laws and resources home to the district that make the 24th district a better place for all of us to live. The second role that I will serve as a member of Congress is being part of a co-equal branch of government with the executive, and that is to act as a check and balance against the executive branch. Uh, this is a way in which we have seen Congressman Katko fail us spectacularly. It is a way in which the Republican-controlled Senate has failed us spectacularly. And it's large, one of the reasons why Democrats won control of the House in 2018 because the Republican-controlled House of Representatives refused to serve as a check on the president. Do you, think, do you think if you had President Biden, you would be a check on a President Biden? Absolutely. And by it the way, is, he has endorsed you, am I correct? On he this? has, yes. I was the first House candidate in the entire country that he endorsed. Uh, it is the job of the legislature to be a check on the president, regardless of whether the parties are the same or different. The legislature is the people's branch. That is the voice of the citizenry. And the primary job is to be direct representation for the people back home in the district. And that means when the president says or does something that is not OK, that you have to stand up and say, this is not OK. This is not what my constituents accept, expect from a president, from a government. We have to do better. It doesn't matter who's in that office. So uh, I mentioned uh, Vice President Biden. Uh, there were initially, after the primary and around the conventions, there were a number of ads uh, using Vice President Biden's words against you. Mm -hmm. um, they dealt with health care. Mm -hmm. So what is your view? Forget the Biden plan for a second. We'll get to that in a second. What is your plan for health care nationally? Sure. Um, I do just want to say that it's absurd uh, that the ads were trying to use Vice President Biden's words against me when, again, I was the first House candidate in the entire country that he endorsed. Um, so I, I've talked about this for a long time. Uh, Health care is the number one issues, issue on people's minds. It is um, incredibly important. And in the time of COVID, it's only become more urgent of an issue for us to deal with. So. The problem is that right now, Americans are stuck in a broken health care system. Um, we really have two systems in this country. We've got the private insurance system, and we've got Medicare. And Medicare is one of our most popular government programs. It's the most health efficient health insurance program in the world. In the private insurance industry, what we have is some people who are satisfied with their coverage, but they're very few and far between. Most people really like their doctors but they don't like their health insurance companies. I have yet to meet the person who says, you know, I love spending hours on the phone arguing with an insurance adjuster. What insurance companies are there to do is to make money. 
And the way they do that is by taking your premiums and denying you coverage. So would you get rid of private insurance companies? I would not. I believe that there is a role for private insurance companies. And this is one of the ways that Congressman Katko misrepresents my position. What I want to do is give everybody in the country access to Medicare. And I think that we should do that in a series of phased expansions. I believe that we should start by lowering the age of eligibility from 65 to 55. We can keep moving that number down if we want to. I believe that we should offer a public buy-in. So anybody of any age who wants to participate in Medicare can. I believe that we should start enrolling babies when they're born. So from day one of life, you are guaranteed coverage until the day you die. And each one of those phases gives more people access, gets more people coverage, and it gives competition to the private insurance industry. And anybody who is a fan of free markets will tell you that when there's more competition, you get better services at better prices. So that is going to make people who have private insurance better off. We keep expanding like that until everybody is covered and if you are not satisfied with what Medicare offers, you have the option of buying coverage on the private market to meet your needs. So how much would your plan cost? So the expansions that we're talking about, and by the way, this is where Joe Biden and I overlap. This is where we agree on health care. He has come out and said that he So wants, there are differences between you and the vice president's plan. Yes. So give, me, give us an example of where there's a difference. So he doesn't talk about, uh, for example, enrolling babies when they're born. Okay. The first two stages of expansion that I talked about are two things that he's committed to doing, lowering the age of eligibility and offering a public buy-in. So I'm really excited to get to Congress and work on passing those things with him. I'm hoping that in that process, I can get him on board with the idea of enrolling babies when they're born. I think that's the next step. And is this much, and this is a lot different though than the Affordable Care Act? It is. It, well, it, it, yes, it is because it um, is expanding access to Medicare so specifically. If, if, if what we had before Affordable Care Act, better known as Obamacare, mm -hmm. moving forward would be a Biden plan. Yours is going a step farther than that. Mm -hmm. So how would you pay for that? But I have also, I just want to say about the Affordable Care Act, because I think this is important. I have also been talking about for three years how we have to protect the Affordable Care Act and strengthen it. Uh, right now it's under attack. We know that the Supreme Court is going to hear this case the week after Election Day. Uh, that's why they're trying to ram through this justice so we'll that they can overturn the ACA. Um, John Katko, his vote on the tax bill set up this court case. It was uh, an effort to sabotage the ACA. And we have to protect and strengthen that. That is the progress that we've made, and we need to keep it. What I'm talking about doing is in addition to that, not instead so again, of that. How much would it cost? So the first two stages of expansion, uh, lowering the age of eligibility and um, offering a public buy-in do not require any new streams of revenue. Joe Biden has made that clear in his plan. They're paid for in general government revenues. The uh, full expansion, if we keep going to the point where everybody is, um, has health care. So a universal plan. Yes, full full universal Which coverage when we get to the end. That's universal. the goal, okay. yes, that's the goal. I think it's going to take us a, a little while to get there. A little while, two years, five years, 10 years, 20 years. Um, I think two to four years is probably not reasonable. I don't think that it's going to happen that fast. I think we need so longer to make this cost? transition. So what it costs is uh, $2 trillion less than our current health care system. So this is, uh, we've heard Congressman Katko and his allies uh, who are trying to scare people throw around the number $32 trillion, right? This came out in a, a study from the Mercatus Center or Institute. I can't remember the name of it exactly. Um, so he says all the time, a $32 trillion tax hike. In fact, what that study shows is that if we keep our health care system the way it currently is, over the next 10 years, we will spend $34 trillion on health care. If we transition 
to a Medicare for all system, we will reduce our health care costs by $2 trillion. But is that shifting burden from employer paid insurance to individuals paying insurance? No. So it's actually saving individuals money. And this is another really important point of the cost question that I think gets lost in the conversation. When we think about how we pay for health care, um, Congressman Katko and his friends only want to use the word taxes. But we all know, those of us who pay for our own health care, which he doesn't, those of us who pay for our own health care know that taxes is only... But no member of Congress uh, from either party unless they opt out. Right. Or the president. They, as we learned right. a couple of weeks ago, pay for their own health care. Right. Which makes them remarkably different and more advantaged than most of their constituents. Um, those of us who pay for our own health care know that uh, there are several categories of cost. We pay for health care through taxes. We pay for health care through premiums. We pay for health care through deductibles. And we pay for health care through co-pays. All of those are our out-of-pocket costs for health care. And one of the problems with our current system, you hear from people all the time who say, you know, I have insurance, but my deductible is $4,600, so I can't afford to go to the doctor, right? So if we think about what health care is costing an individual or a household, it's that whole bucket of costs, taxes, deductibles, co-pays, and premiums. Under a Medicare for All system, that bucket of costs gets smaller for 95% of households. The only people who will pay more for health care under this system are the top 5%. And I'm okay with that. Shift gears. Supreme sure. Court, you mentioned uh, a court case that's coming up a couple of days after Election Day. Mm -hmm. uh, should President Trump have nominated Amy uh, Coney Barrett? Uh, who the president nominates? entirely his prerogative. But he had a right to do so, correct? He has an obligation to do so under the Constitution. He nominates whoever he wants to nominate. I have uh, no argument with that. What I think is completely inappropriate and should not be done is for this nomination process to be happening while an election is going on. So would you support a, Congress a, a constitutional amendment? Because I think that's the only way that most likely can this an honor system doesn't work, clearly, because Merrick Garland is a well, perfect example of this. The honor we, system worked before Mitch McConnell destroyed the democratic norms that governed that but honor But should system. there be a constitutional amendment that bars the president from appointing a Supreme Court judge in the final year of a four-year term? Um, okay, so I've never th thought about this question That's before. why I'm here. Um, but no. Uh, the president is not president for three years. The president is president for but four years. But to keep years. it out of, the, uh, out of an election year. Well, but there's a big difference. I, I think you're talking about an entire year. There is a big difference between election right, year, which is a 12-month month period. I guess a, a window where you can't make those appointments. I don't know that a constitutional amendment is the right way to do that. I, don't, I think amending the Constitution is a very big deal. And I'm not sure that this is appropriate for that. But again, I haven't thought about this Would before. Would you support uh, expanding the court since there's going to be a I don't tilt? know. This is, you know, I've been asked this question many times. that may not be a times. Senate issue. That would be a congressional issue. I've been asked this question many times in the last few weeks, and it's not something I have ever thought about before, and I need to learn a lot more about it before so, I can so take a So we talked about the issue of health care. The other question that many... Uh, people are raising is this issue of abortion mm -hmm. and, and spe spe specifically Roe versus Wade. Mm -hmm. But before getting to Roe versus Wade, what is your position on abortion? My position on abortion is the same as my position on every other health care decision, which is that health care decisions bet belong between a patient and their doctor. In the case of abortion, that decision belongs between a woman and her doctor Whomever else she chooses to bring in, spiritual advisor, partner, that's up to her. How about barring third uh, There's trimester? no place for government in that conversation. Even in third uh, trimester? Okay, so let's talk about this. Because this is uh, one of the big arguments um, that is uh, raised in this conversation and I think is incredibly misunderstood. 
fewer than 1% of abortions happen in the third trimester. Fewer than 1%. We are talking about a tiny, tiny fraction. And we should be talking about what those cases are because the president and the people who have been for decades promoting anti-abortion rhetoric are not honest about what that is. What we are talking about when an abortion happens in the third trimester, we are talking about a woman, possibly a partner with her, who have been expecting a child, who have been preparing to welcome a child into the world. And something has gone terribly wrong with that pregnancy that has either put the life of the fetus or the life of the mother in extreme danger. It is not a decision that is entered into lightly. It is not done for the purposes of, I've changed my mind and I don't want to have a baby. These are devastating medical cases. And again, there is no place for government in that conversation. That is for a woman, her doctor, and whoever is supporting her to handle. And we should be looking at that with compassion. Do you, th do you have a worry that uh, a justice Barrett will overturn Roe versus Wade? Absolutely, I do. So that brings up something that's in a whole series of new ads. And we're going to get to ads in a second, but on this sure. particular one is this issue of could Congress codify and protect abortion rights? Congress can and should. And, and that's why we can't send Congressman Katko back to Congress. Because you've indicated that he, he would not be supportive of that. I haven't indicated that. He has indicated that. Congressman Katko himself said that if he had a vote, he would vote to overturn Roe v. Wade. So, and again, just for the record, we're talking to Dana Balter, who's a Democratic candidate for the 24th Congressional District. We have... Uh, invited both of your opponents uh, to be here. Congressman Katko was offered several dates. He declined all of them. Mm -hmm. You accepted uh, uh, St Steve Williams, which we'll get to in just a second. We're going to talk a little bit about sure. the campaign right now, uh, is on the Working Families line. Well, I guess we should talk about Steve Williams. He was uh, what some would call a placeholder, mm -hmm. that the Working Families Party put him on that ballot, assuming that he would uh, remove himself once the primary between yourself and Mr. Uh, Canola finished, correct? Mm -hmm. He's he's since endorsed you. Yes, he has. And um, does that system need to be changed of how they do that? Um, and more importantly, do we need these secondary parties beyond, you know, beyond Republican and Democratic? Yeah, I don't really have an answer to that question. Um, I think that there are good reasons to have minor parties. I think um, it's you know, the more uh, democratic engagement we have, the more diversity of opinion and perspective is represented in, in political conversation, I think the better. I think that's healthy for democracy. Um, it certainly can present some challenges. Um, and I don't know what the best way, I don't have a clear opinion on what the best way to um, make sure that minor parties are, uh, you know, as constructive and productive as they can be. But um, the way that the process exists right now um, has, been, has gone through the courts and is the legal process that we have right now. So those are the rules that we have to abide by. Two uh, election uh, questions as well, and I've asked this of other candidates. But do you have any concerns about the safety of balloting in New York? I don't. I have uh, great confidence in our boards of elections. They are doing a phenomenal job in very difficult circumstances. Um, they're <laughs> the folks who work at the boards of elections in our district are working pretty much around the clock now through election day to make sure that every single vote that's cast is counted. And one of the reasons that we may not have an answer to the presidency on uh, November 3rd is mm -hmm. in many states, including New York, we don't count ballots early. Right. Should we in New York? Um, and if so, how would you do it? So from the perspective of a candidate who's running, right, I'd like a, the ballots to get counted as soon as possible because I don't want to, you know, I'm going to be on pins and needles for a couple weeks after Election Day, and I'm just as impatient as the next person. Um, but the most important thing is to make sure that the election is done with integrity and that we can rely on the results. And so 
as in the case of dealing with the COVID pandemic, I am looking to the experts to tell me how to best do this. And the experts have said, this is the best procedure to ensure that every vote is counted, that the election results are um, not only recorded, but reported with the utmost integrity. And so I'm gonna learn to be patient just like everybody else. Because, and we just went through a school board election here and, and the numbers were just astounding of how many people participate. So many people voted. I do you know. think it will be that you will not know in your, even in your own race? I think that's entirely likely. Um, you know, we don't. And by we the way, if this was seventeen uh, right. ninety six, <laughs> we'd have okay, to be patient. We'd have right. to be patient. But now with computers, we want everything to happen fast, right? Um, I, you know, I don't think we're going to know until election day how much of the vote is cast in person versus uh, remotely. In the primary this year, in our June primary, about sixty percent of the vote was cast by absentee ballot through the mail. So um, it's certainly possible we'll see numbers like that again this fall. I think, based on my conversations with voters, that there are many more people who feel comfortable voting in person because we don't have um, rapidly spreading virus around here. Mm. Uh, so my expectation is that we'll see higher numbers voting in person, but we really don't know. So the one thing that will end on November 3rd, are unless uh, we have a close presidential race, are mostly going to be advertisements, at least locally. Mm -hmm. And it's <laughs> not that I'm not going to miss, that I haven't missed my favorite personal injury attorney right. or my favorite car dealership, but you guys are on the air a, a lot. lot. Mm -hmm. uh, and I say this globally. Mm -hmm. Do you have an idea of how much your campaign alone at, at this point will spend on just television advertising? Um, I I don't have the figure just for TV Will be more ads. Than, well, what's, what is it but, overall? So I expect that by the time the election is over, the campaign will have spent about $3.3 million. And is that up from 2018? Yes. Not a, not a huge amount. And that does bit. not include the independent ads. Right. That's just, that doesn't include Congressman Katko's ads. That doesn't include independent expenditures from organizations. Any idea how on, much all of this, in, I mean... Obviously, so, three, five, nine, ten, Spectrum, yeah, Verizon, Vos. Yeah, um, they are going to have a good quarter. My get, yes, they are. Um, last cycle, the all-in, the race cost about ten million dollars, including the independent, including the independent expenditures. My guess is that this year it'll probably be around twelve million. Do you, uh, you do not have a say on the independents? Nope. You cannot meet with them. You cannot talk with them. Nope. Do you think they should be banned? Um, in the ideal campaign finance system. And this goes into the Citizens United issue yep, about independent expenditure. I think expenditure. all of that should be gone. And um, what do you think about all the photos that are appearing on some of these ads? They're delightful, aren't they? Uh, I was going to say, I, I, I was surprised. Um, are you surprised that they're using some of the most uh, what unflattering I would say? pictures Unfla in the history better, of the world? Um, well, they see they don't think the pictures are unflattering enough, so then they edit them to make them look even more unflattering. Oh, so um, they've been edited, and in your view? Oh, sure. They they use um, you know color washes, and they'll add you know lines to them, and they'll darken them. Absolutely. Um, I'm. Are you doing the same? No. Your your campaign. I forget the independence. Is no. your campaign mod, uh, modifying any of Congressman Katko's no. facial features? No. Um, no, I wouldn't approve of that being done. Um, it's part of um, the boundaries that I draw for what I believe is appropriate and acceptable in campaigning, uh, which is to A, always be honest and forthright, um, and B, to never misrepresent anything, either that I believe or say or that my opponent believes or says. Um, I am not in any way surprised that he and his campaign and the people who are supporting his campaign are doing this because it is in keeping with what we've seen from him over the years. I will say this year is particularly disgusting. Uh, he has reached new lows, but it's not surprising. It is disappointing because um, not only is it... Uh, you know, unkind and disrespectful and all of those things, I'm a big girl, I can handle it. But it's disrespectful to voters. And when I look at those ads and I see 
uh, the messages that he's putting out there about women, about people of color. Um, what I think about is the kids at home watching TV. I think about the little girls who are watching those ads, the little girls who are excited to see a woman stand up and run for office, who come up to me in the grocery store and ask to take my picture, be in a picture with me, because they didn't know women could do this, and they want to grow up to do it too. And they are at home watching these ads, and by doing what he's doing with those photographs, he is telling them that they are worth less, that they don't belong in this arena. Um, I talked to uh, <clears throat> I talked to a mother a couple of weeks ago about um, one of the commercials that the congressman is running about bail reform, his ridiculous argument where he's saying, I want to let dangerous criminals roam free in our streets, which of course is absurd and couldn't be further from the truth. And in this ad, uh, there is an image of a man in a hoodie walking through a neighborhood with ominous music and the voiceover is talking about how he's, but he's a dangerous criminal. But he's placing your signs. No, no, that's a different commercial. Oh, that's a different, okay. That's a different commercial. And that was sarcasm, I'm yeah. sorry. That, that commercial is just silly. This one is not. He, they are using the image of a man in a hoodie to connote a dangerous criminal, which we all know is a racist stereotype. And I had a mother come to me she is a black woman with a black teenage son who told me that that commercial makes her son less safe. That is not acceptable. And that kind of rhetoric, that use of dangerous stereotypes has, as far as I am concerned, no place in honorable political discourse. I want to... Uh come to just two of these ads. And, and the first one I want to ask about, because there's a second question that's a more uh, follow-up we got from a, a viewer, is one of the attack ads against you is the, that you ran, uh, that when you've run, you've had a tax issue in Florida. Mm -hmm. It doesn't say that as it did two years ago, uh, but more importantly, that you're paying yourself as, uh, uh, from the campaign. Am, am I correct on that? That's the ad. Yeah, there, there are multiple ads saying okay. those things. Yeah. And um, I, I ask that because when that ad plays, there's a follow-up ad that is usually yours mm -hmm. that rebuts that. Mm -hmm. Do you pay a premium for that? What do you mean? To, to, to make sure yeah, they're, 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 they're bookending. Uh, no, and I don't know that we actually um, are doing it deliberately. Control that. Okay. Yeah, I. Th I it was a viewer question. They yeah. said there's the one, and then yours seems to be. I mean, literally the next right ad. Right after. Yeah, I think that is. Um, fortunate but accidental timing. Okay. <laughs> um, my understanding of, and I'm not the one who places the ad buys, but my understanding of the way television ad buying works is that you, um, you place an ad during a half an hour slot of television that you don't have control over where it goes. So I, I want to go to the second ad, and you've mentioned the bail reform issue. So what, first of all, bail reform, the, New York did some bail reform uh, more than a year ago deal with cashless bail and, and, and other items there. We talked to the candidates for the 130th uh, two days ago about this. What is your position on bail reform? Mm -hmm. Could you clear up? Yeah. I, I know they had to say one thing, but what is your position on, yes. on bail reform? So um, I'm going to start by saying what my position is not, again, which is uh, my position is not that we should let dangerous criminals roam free. Uh, I believe that our bail system, as with our larger criminal justice system, should do three things. It should uh, keep our communities safe, it should give victims of crime justice, and it should treat people fairly. And bail reform is about treating people fairly. One of our most fundamental principles in this country is equal treatment under the law. And the problem with the cash bail system as it exists in most places is that it doesn't treat people equally under the law. Your freedom, whether or not you are held in jail or able to go home to your family, is in many cases contingent on the size of your bank account. 
and that's not right. So bail reform is simply about correcting that should problem. Be, should more be done on bail reform? Well, we then still... Then what has been done in New York so far? We are still seeing uh, how the law is working. Changes have already been made, and we need to see with any law, as you're moving forward, you should constantly be reevaluating and seeing if you need to make new tweaks. But the point is, you know, Congressman Katko uh, never said a word before about the wealthy people who were able to pay bail and be out on the streets. It's only a concern when now that same, um, that same option is extended to people who don't have a lot of money. Is this a state or a federal issue? It's a state issue. Uh, so I've got a couple, we've got about five minutes left, and we had a, a number of viewer questions that we wanted to just ask you just real quickly on. Um, do you support the legalization of re recreational marijuana? I do. Uh, why? Because um, its criminalization has led to mass incarceration, because um, it is uh, no more dangerous to us than alcohol, which is legal, and because it gives us the opportunity for a whole new industry to generate tax revenue that we can then invest in things like education and infrastructure and health care. Do the way that police departments operate across the country, or, or more specifically in central New York, need to change? Yes. Does that mean um, defunding? No. And, and, and would you define what you consider defunding? Well, I think the word defunding means taking money away from. Um, I do not support that. Uh, I have repeatedly said I think we should actually be investing more in public safety, not less. What we need to, the reforms need to focus on changing the things about policing that are not working currently. Uh, there are some things that police officers are very good at, they are trained to do, and that's what we should be asking them to do, which is deal with crime and criminals. There are a lot of things in our current system that we're asking police officers to do that they should not be doing. We're asking them to handle mental health crises. We're asking them to handle domestic violence and substance abuse and homelessness. That's not what police officers are trained for. Luckily, we've got lots of professionals and organizations in our communities who know how to tackle those public challenges. And we've got to make sure, in the interest of public safety, that we're funding those programs as well. We've got to think about community safety as a much broader picture. And then we also have to institute reforms that change the things that some officers and some departments are doing badly. And that means a national use of force policy that bans chokeholds and only permits lethal, the use of lethal force when it is absolutely necessary. It means a national conduct of a national registry of police misconduct. So an officer who gets fired for misconduct in one department can't just go to another town and get hired as an officer there. It means demilitarizing our police department. No local department needs a tank. You'll never convince me otherwise. Our military should not be giving excess equipment there. And it means giving citizen review boards, which are uh, local community tools to exercise oversight and accountability over police departments, real authority, so that that accountability is meaningful. Uh, another switching gears, mm -hmm. uh, Hunter Biden, uh, Vice President uh, Biden's son, is in the news right now, specifically in the New York Post. I think there's a whole series of articles there. Okay. And that is in regards to uh, alleged influence uh, peddling, um, in the Ukraine and activities there. Mm -hmm. Whether that occurred or not occurred, my, more importantly, the question from the viewer is, should that be investigated by law enforcement? Or has it been adjudicated as far as you're concerned? Well, I don't know exactly what that story alleges. Well, there's a whole series of them. So um, I, I can't speak to whether that has already been investigated, but my understanding of the concerns surrounding Hunter Biden is that they have been investigated repeatedly and that the uh, conclusion from American intelligence agencies is very clear uh, that there was not wrongdoing there. However, I think the larger question about this, and I don't have all the details of the New York Post story, 
is the concern about disinformation and who is um, planting disinformation. We know this is a, a foreign interference tool. We know that uh, Russia, for one, has been doing it for a long time. This is part of how they have been interfering in our elections. Campaign? Disinformation? Not that I'm aware of. Could be. So I want to, go, I want to take the step further than the, the Hunter Biden issue. And mm -hmm. this is a, a general issue of influence peddling. Mm -hmm. um, that are you know, buying influence in this country, where we require candidates, uh, more importantly, elected federal officials mm -hmm. and their spouses to do disclosure forms. Mm -hmm. Whether they're perfect or not, that's a different issue. Mm -hmm. But they do not impact their parents, their in-laws, or their children. Mm -hmm. And there's become this new route, whether it's Eastern Europe or, or Asia, where the new route is benefit the children, and you'll get favorable, mm, and, I, and I'm favor. saying this to both parties. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying this is a whole book on this and, and all that. Do we need to expand disclosure beyond just the candidate or, or the incumbent and their spouse mm -hmm. or significant other? Um, again, this is not something I have thought about before, so I don't have a ready answer. Um, I don't know whether that is necessary. I think the answer to that probably depends on the level of office that you're talking about. Um, but what I do know for sure is that we need to do a better job with ethics rules across the board. And this is true for members of Congress and for members of the executive branch. And one of the things that I want to work on in Congress is um, repairing the things about our political system that are broken right now. And I think ethics is a really big part of that. Uh, so is campaign finance and how we pay for elections. So is voter protection and ending gerrymandering. There are a lot of components there. Uh, the House passed HR1, which was a really big step to making those necessary changes. Uh, it's something that I plan to spend a lot of time working on in Congress. Uh, last. Uh maybe one or two questions. Uh, sure. Do you support Syracuse Mayor Ben Walsh, this is a viewer question, Mayor Ben Walsh's decision to move the Columbus statue at Columbus Circle in Syracuse from its current location? I do. I think uh, that was the right decision after a long and difficult conversation that uh, the community got to participate in. I think uh, this is part of a reckoning we're doing across the country of understanding the difference between honoring our history and commemorating our history and glorifying figures from history who are responsible for atrocities. And those are two different things. But wouldn't things. the counter be that we would not necessarily have the, the Americas, yes, other people were here first, but you wouldn't have the Americas as we know it without Spain and Christopher Columbus? So I think there's no question that it's an important historical event, right? Um, but there is a difference between glorifying a person who is responsible for crime, what we would now consider crimes against humanity, and honoring a historical event that uh, was part of the founding of our country. And we have to be able, these, these conversations are by their very nature, complicated and nuanced. And we have to be willing to engage with those nuances. And I think what the mayor, my understanding, I have not talked to him about this, I've only read the reporting in the news. But my understanding is that what the decision was, was not just to take down this statue, but the decision was to honor the history and accomplishments of Italian Americans, which I believe is what the people who uh, want that statue to stay there are really supporting, right, is they want recognition of the contributions of Italian Americans to our community, and that's very important. There are ways to do that other than with a statue of Christopher Columbus, who is a symbol of um, violence and uh, genocide to indigenous people. Last question uh, in, in two parts. Uh, you said last time around this cost about ten million dollars for I think that's what it came to. How, yeah. how much do you think this one will cost? I think it's going to be about 12 million but we don't really know. So what would you do if you had a magic wand mm -hmm. uh, to change the way you fundraise or you expend money 
And that's the last question, and we're going to... Yeah. Uh, if I had a magic wand, I would get rid of all the private money in elections, and I would make our election season no more than three months long. Would you go to public financing? Yes. You would, okay. So that, um, but very small amounts of money, right? So we wouldn't be spending... $12 million on an election, maybe we'd spend $300,000 on an election. So the campaign would be three months long, uh, which means legislators would get to spend the majority of their term actually doing their jobs instead of campaigning and ra raising money. It means that uh, none of our elected officials would be beholden to big donors. They would only be beholden to us, the people that they represent. And it means that we would not have to deal with those nasty campaign commercials and all of the bombardment of political rhetoric for 18 months uh, every two years. And instead, we could confine campaigns to this little narrow window where we have real discussions about the choices between candidates and spend the rest of our time actually solving our problems. So there is hope for uh, personal injury lawyers and, and car dealers. So <laughs> yes, advertise we'd give them back all the airtime. Time. We do want to thank uh, congressional candidate Dana Balter, who's been with us for about an hour. I try to keep track of time, but we, we're having a time issue here, mm -hmm. uh, uh, who has agreed to participate uh, in this uh, conversation. Uh, as we said at the beginning of the show, uh, we have a simple rule here that we offer our opportunities for forums here. If a candidate uh, accepts and their opponent uh, or opponents decline or don't respond, we do give them that time. And we want to thank you again for your time today uh, and uh, wish you well on the campaign trail as we do all candidates of both parties here. We'll be back on Tuesday, October 20th, with the candidates for the 51st Senate District Forum with uh, Jim Barber, who's a Democrat, facing uh, Peter Oberrocker, who is uh, a Republican, to fill the seat that is being created uh, by the retirement of Senator James Seward, uh, who we hope to have here in a couple of weeks. On October 22nd, will be the candidates for the uh, uh, 50th uh, Senate District with John Manning, a Democrat, against Angie Renna, who is a Republican. And that is being uh, filled, uh, that's a vacant seat that will take over immediately uh, due to the resignation of first-term Senator Robert Antonacci. On Tuesday, October 7th, 27th, is the final forum for the 126th Assembly District. That's with Dia Carvajal, who's a Democrat, running against John Lamondes who's a Republican, to fill the seat being vacated by the retirement of Assemblyman Gary D. Finch. I'll moderate the forums, and as usual, uh, Citizen Executive Editor Jeremy Boyer will be asking the questions. He will be remote for this process, as we're trying to stick with the COVID-19 protocols of both SUNY and public health officials locally. Before we go, though, we would like to let you know that you can send us your ideas for uh, questions or future guests uh, for Inside Government or beyond the front page to COZGUY. At, uh, THO at AOL.com or Inside Government 141 Dunning Avenue, Auburn, New York 13021. I'm Guy Cosentino for Q Community College. We want to thank you for watching. We hope you are safe and remember that you can start going uh, to remote polling this uh, Saturday uh, to uh, cast your vote on the 17th. Good night and have a great tomorrow.